Today we have Judy Scott Clayton um, from uh, Columbia uh, presenting to us. Um, I think there are at least um, there are several reasons to be really interested in and focused on the paper that Judy's going to be presenting today. The first of which is that Judy's a brilliant presenter and it'll be interesting. But the, the other substantive reasons uh, are that, you know, this is a paper that focuses on longer term outcomes for educational interventions. In my class just yesterday, um, uh, students were asking me, why don't we have more evidence of longer term outcomes? And I pointed out we have to wait for people to get older. <laughs> but uh, so uh, Judy has some uh, results from that. The second reason is that she employs a novel data source, um, the Equifax uh, database for tracking down some of these outcomes. And I'm sure many of you will be um, uh, wanting to learn from Judy just how to get access to those data. So, um, uh, so Judy, uh, welcome. We're, we're, we're lucky to have you Thank you so much. It is my pleasure to be here back in Cambridge again. Um, I did my PhD at the Kennedy School Public Policy Program and actually um, worked on um, some, a prior paper looking at earlier outcomes from the same scholarship program. So it really feels like coming full, full circle to come back here and be able to talk about the long-term uh, follow-up. So before I start, I just want to acknowledge my co-author, Basit uh, Zafar, who uh, was at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and without whom this project would never have gotten off the ground. She's now at Arizona State. And the motivation for this project is pretty straightforward, so I won't spend a ton of time on it. But, um, you know, everybody's worried about rising costs of going to college, rising sticker prices at um, public institutions nationwide, and that really reflects a long-term shift in how post-secondary, public post-secondary education is financed in the U.S., where um, states used to subsidize heavily um, tuition prices to keep them low. Um, as they have cut back on their own kind of direct support to institutions, to which tuition prices have gone up, and instead a lot of the state efforts have shifted into financial aid programs. So um, a lot of, um, uh, of pressure is now placed on these financial aid programs. Do they, do they actually work or not at improving student outcomes? And uh, merit-based programs, in fact, have been um, one of the fastest forms, uh, fastest growing forms of state aid. So when I'm talking about merit aid programs, I'm not talking about like the National Merit Scholarship, which only a, a small percentage of students get every year. But broad-based programs like the one in the study in West Virginia where a significant fraction of the high school graduating class might qualify. So in the case of West Virginia, it's about 25% of the class, um, and you need a, a medium, basically above the median score on the ACT or SAT. So a significant fraction of the incoming freshman class qualifies for this merit-based aid. And um, while there's a fair amount of research now, when, when I was just starting out this project, there wasn't nearly so much, um, but now there's much more evidence documenting that programs like this uh, can increase college enrollment and completion, but there's still, uh, that's certainly not always the case, just because it can work and does work in some instances doesn't mean it always does, and there's still significant questions about whether the significant costs of these programs justify, um, whether the benefits justify the costs. And that cost-benefit calculation, to really make progress on that, we need to have some long-term outcomes. Um, but still, there's very little research on um, that follows students beyond college completion out into the labor force to see um, what the long-term effects of this scholarship, prog scholarship programs like this are. So just to spend a, a couple of minutes filling in on what we already know from prior research on the impacts of state merit aid programs. Um, as I noted, there are a number of studies showing that these programs can have positive effects on enrollment and completion. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that they always do. One of the best known kind of counter examples um, is the Cohotas and Goodman paper looking at the Massachusetts Adams Scholarship, which had kind of perverse effects because this state merit aid program, what it ended up doing was um, it worked so well at convincing students to go to the, the state institutions, it ended up actually drawing them away from better resourced institutions that they would have gone to otherwise, and it ended up lowering completion rates. Um, and there are a couple of papers, um, let me see if I can make this, yes, okay. A couple of papers using national data, so not just looking at uh, uh, one or two state programs, but kind of looking at merit aid programs across the country and finding um, much more modest uh, evidence or, you know, much smaller and sometimes insignificant evidence that, that these programs work on average. And uh, there's only one other paper that we're aware of at this point um, by uh, Bettinger and co-authors that's able to track students beyond uh, college graduation into um, the labor force. That paper does find evidence of um, positive effects on post-college earnings, at least for some students. But we're wanting to add to that literature and, and um, as I'll talk about the data in a minute, look at some other outcomes besides just earnings. Can, yes. Can I interrupt one yes, thing? and so, please do interrupt. Yes. Um, when you're saying whether a state merit aid program mm -hmm. works or doesn't work, like I'm struggling to think about what counterfactual exactly I should have in mind. Like, is it the student uh, deciding whether or not to go to post-secondary education without that award available, or is it the aid instead being allocated sort of according to need? Uh, and and how, I yes. can also imagine. Mm -hmm. Part of the theory of action behind a merit aid program being incentives to do well academically in order to be eligible upon entry. Mm -hmm. Are we thinking about that margin as well? When Absolutely. And, and when I talk about like the design of the program and some of this, I think what we can get into that more. But as far as the big picture question, like we're not going to be able to say like if they weren't doing this program, would they have been doing something else that was more um, impact, you know, impactful? That's kind of a big picture resource allocation that's, um, we're not going to be able to go that far. And this, this study is a, a, a narrower, you know, does this program, access to this program improve outcomes relative to those who in the same world didn't get access to it, you know. Um, so we don't see, you know, we can look at some things like, you know, did, if you get access to this program, does that mean you're less likely to get access to some other programs? But it's still kind of in the same broader context. Oh, yes, exactly. And then, can you, to add to this, can yeah. you also comment on earnings as a barometer of success, uh, given that, for example, Phil Ariopoulos' work that says, you know, like, if you get a conditional on uh, earnings, you're much happier to have a college degree. <laughs> right. So I don't think we want to um, suggest that earnings are the be-all, end-all, um, uh, outcome measure, and in fact, one of the things that, that I, I like to do in my work is present a whole bunch of outcome measures. In fact, um, you know, some people may think too many outcome measures looking at. Um, so, um, but that said, it is an important um, thing that, you know, a, a lot of people care about and where we'd like to see that something is going on there? Um, is it definitive? And, and you know, these there, there's still tons of limitations here. The students, even you know, even though we can follow them 10 years, 10, 11 years after entry, that's still not really long enough to even get good, you know, the ideal measures of earnings. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons why some of the other outcomes that we're going to look at here, including home ownership, um, graduate degree attainment. And looking at the types of the the income level of the neighborhood they're, they're living in, so it's not necessarily just their income, but the the um, broader uh, average income of the where they're living can give us some different dimensions on that. And in some ways, might be potentially better than looking at their specific earnings when they're 28. Yeah. So, Judy, just following up on mm -hmm. Marty's question, an, another mechanism that I is the minimum. Credits, absolutely. Uh, Thirty credits per year, and the minimum GPA of three point mm -hmm. Like, not all of these programs have that. But absolutely, I, isn't you're going to be arguing like maybe that policy? Absolutely. Like, so, a big part of um, so going back to some of this this work here, that's looking at kind of using national data and looking at all the states 
there are like 13 states that, or maybe more at this point, who have implemented different types of merit aid programs over the, over the course of time and finding not much going on there. But they all are different when you dig down into the details, how big the scholarship was, how many years you could qualify for it, um, how high or low the eligibility criteria were, and what sort of criteria they had to renew. So in the prior study that I did of the same scholarship program focused a lot on the in-college effects of the program, looking at credit completion, GPAs, persistence, and graduation. And in that paper, I spent a lot of time looking at kind of the mechanisms and to what extent do we think this program is just the money versus the, the incentives and these renewal requirements. And I, I'll talk about that more late, later, um, but definitely um, let's come back to thinking about, you know, what are the, what are the implications of this study? You, you know, how, does, how might it or might it not generalize to other types of financial aid, including other state merit aid programs that have different different requirements. Okay, so what we're going to do in this paper is uh, examine the West Virginia Promise Scholarship, which I'll go into more detail in a couple of slides. Um, it's actually, you know, 40 million maybe isn't that much per year, but it's a small state, so it was covering free tuition and fees for up to four years for students who qualified. And um, I think one of the uh, unique um, contributions of this study is the ability to um, follow students post-college for a fairly long amount of time, but also, I'll just put them all up there now, um, to link it to this new source of data that hasn't been previously linked to education data, which are, are the um, Equifax credit reports. Um, and as far as how we're going to actually estimate a causal effect here, um, we are going to apply primarily a regression discontinuity approach. And I'm going to focus on those results for this talk, just in the interest of time. We also use a difference in difference approach. Um, and in a real world setting, and that is a euphemism for um, messy identification, um, which is the reality in a real world setting where you're you know, looking at a policy that's implemented at scale in an entire state. Um, so there are advantages and there are disadvantages, and we will talk about some of the complications um, in great detail in this in this presentation, but just to preview qu uh, quickly for those of you who um, may not be able to stay till the very end, um, the results do provide strong support, um, evidence that there are long-lasting effects of promise across a range of outcomes, and I just want to pause and note that even though prior work on this same program had found uh, positive effects on bachelor's degree completion after four years, so it found um, strong evidence that this program kind of moves students through to completion faster. There was evidence that those effects were potentially attenuated over time. So if you looked five years out, they were a little bit smaller. That was as far as I could go at the time. Um, but, it, and so, you know, some people, was one of the graduate students had, had, you know, sent a question, which was, you know, how long do you have to follow people up for? Like when, can you know whether something has worked or not? And, um, you know, obviously there's a fair amount of research documenting if you get people to complete, like that should have positive outcomes on, you know, the, uh, their future. Um, but why people might be skeptical in this case <coughs> is, you know, what if um, the marginal student is actually not as capable or not as qualified? Maybe their returns aren't going to be as high. Maybe all this scholarship does is get people to take kind of easier classes and lower payoff fields. So maybe their, their outcomes aren't going to be as good. On the other hand, there are other reasons to think that even for those students whose completion wasn't affected, those students who were going to complete with or without the scholarship, now they're graduating with much less debt. And that might have effects on, uh, on their graduate attainment, on their home ownership on their, um, their career choices and things like that, that might show up later but wouldn't show up in college completion. So those are all reasons why we thought it would be valuable to um, follow these students up longer. Um, so we see positive effects uh, for students who just barely qualified for this scholarship on graduate degree attainment, uh, home, home ownership, and in the average income of where they're living. So they're living in higher income zip codes than students who just missed out. And when we talk about mechanisms, 
we'll talk about the, the suggestive evidence, it's not you know, totally definitive, but suggestive evidence that it looks like the time to degree is the primary channel. So these students graduated from college faster than their counterparts who didn't qualify for the scholarship, rather than uh, the mechanism being uh, reductions in their undergraduate debt. Okay, so layout of the talk. I will talk more about the program itself and, and the context of West Virginia, which is not uh, the most representative state. Um, I'll talk about the methodology and the sample, the data, um, and then we'll get right into the main results. I have a bunch of other results kind of in the file that we can click into if people are interested. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the work that we did to try to address the, some of the fundamental um, identification challenges in the paper mechanisms, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions. Okay. So this program, uh, providing real opportunities to maximize in-state student excellence, had, uh, it, it came about, uh, it was implemented for the first time in 2002, and it had uh, multiple motivations from the state policy perspective, um, which are all kind of squished into the title there. Um, so part of it was, uh, you know, re reducing the cost of college. That was a clear uh, motivation for the program. But they also, West Virginia is concerned about brain drain, and a real motivation of the program was to try to retain more of their quote-unquote best and brightest students in, in the state instead of sending them out of the state for college. And they also wanted to create incentives for students' um, effort and achievement, both at the high school level as well as once they're in college. So to qualify initially for the scholarship, you needed to be a West Virginia high school graduate um, within two years of high school graduation. You needed at least a 3.0 high school GPA, and that was overall, and then they also had a, something called a core course GPA. And you needed to score at least a 21 on the ACT, which is the primary test that um, students take in West Virginia, or a 1,000 or above on the SAT. And um, there were no income limitations, so it was completely not um, conditional on need. Um, and in order to get it in that first year, you needed to enroll full-time in a West Virginia um, public or private college. They had like a smaller, it wasn't going to cover full tuition, but they would give you something to go to the private schools as well. <coughs> um, and as uh, Professor Kane noted, one of the key aspects of this um, scholarship that makes it kind of distinct from some of the other state merit aid programs was its renewal requirements. So its initial eligibility requirements are fairly um, uh, not atypical of, of state merit aid programs, but in order to renew the scholarship for the second year, the third year, the fourth year, um, you needed to complete at least 30 credits per academic year and maintain at least a 3.0 GPA with a little bit of a buffer uh, they gave you in the first year. And the idea behind this was to try to promote on-time degree progression. Um, so at the time, only a couple of states had this sort of stringent um, renewal requirements. And as I found in my earlier work, that turns out to be really important for um, promoting on-time completion. Just to give you a sense, obviously West Virginia is not the most representative uh, context to look at a study, uh, look at a, a program like this. Um, a couple of key things to keep in mind in terms of the generalizability here are that um, West Virginia University, the flagship public institution, is the highest ranked institution in the state, so it doesn't there are private institutions, but it's not like Massachusetts, for example. Um, the uh, college entry and completion rate in West Virginia, um, just prior to uh, implementation of this program, was very low. One of the worst rates in the nation, about um, uh, under 20% of the, of the 25 to 34-year-old population, under 20% had a bachelor's degree. Um, which is about 10 percentage points lower than the national average and kind of akin, roughly akin to rates, national averages from like the 1970s and 80s. Um, so it's a very low attainment state. 
um, where it doesn't have a lot of pri like highly ranked private institutions. Um, tuition rates, on average, um, are lower. But then again, the, the average income of the state is also lower. Um, to speak a little bit about like what are students getting if they're not getting this, they do have, uh, obviously, <coughs> access to federal Pell Grants. Um, qualifying for this scholarship does not affect that at all. Um, they also had a state need-based aid program in addition to Pell. Um, and both of those programs are kind of separate from this one. There was no crowding out of need-based aid if somebody qualified for this scholarship. And about 40% of the incoming freshman population uh, did receive a promise. Okay. So let me tell you about the data. So the data from West Virginia Higher Education Policy <coughs> Commission is pretty typical of what you would get in a state higher education administrative database at, at this point in time. So um, it's got complete transcripts, uh, financial aid, receipt, um, degree completion. Um, and then we have some information that comes along with the college application. So the uh, ACT or SAT scores that they report on the application. We can talk more about the implications of that. We don't have like every time that they took the ACT or SAT. And we have a high school GPA. We don't have the exact high school GPA that was used for determining eligibility for the program, nor do we have the exact SAT or ACT score that was. Um, so that, you know, there's some file somewhere that we don't have access to that is used to determine prom promise eligibility. Um, we don't have that. What we have is coming through the applications that are sent to the colleges. And that will become somewhat important later. Um, so we can come back to that. Um, we have two cohorts before the program and two cohorts after the program. After the second cohort, they started changing the eligibility requirements because um, way more people were getting the scholarship. It was like they probably, maybe they didn't like think, okay, in the second year, this program's going to be at least twice as expensive. And the third year, you know, they're adding another cohort. And, and so by the third year, they were trying to look for ways to constrain um, constrain the costs. That, that's yes. related to the lower educational attainment. <laughs> By the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Why did the costs go up? Were, like, were, were students' strategic behavior about like, what they were doing in high school? Was that no, no. I mean, part of it is just literally, like, the oh, first cohort, you only have one class. cohort. And then the second cohort, now you suddenly have two. And then the third year, you have three. And then the fourth year, you have four. And only then do you kind of get into the more steady state. I'm not saying that, but. Right. I mean, legislators don't always have the longest time around. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And sometimes even if you can kind of see it coming, it's like until it's really you're feeling that pressure. Right, exactly. How was this funded? Was it this was it like lottery money or? No, this is not a lottery funded scholarship. Maybe it would have been more robust if it were. Um, so like I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't have uh, any indication that was like specifically linked to a revenue stream. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So. Okay, um, so, uh, you know, the, the post-secondary data is fairly typical of what you get uh, from a post-secondary administrative data set. Um, we do also have um, in-state quarterly earnings records um, that, uh, but just keep in mind, that's in-state only. And, and as far as the post-secondary records, keep in mind, those are the public institutions only. So if they transfer to a private institution, if they go out of state, we do not observe that. So only if they stay within the public sector. If they transfer across the public institutions, we can see that. Yep. So you have no data about people who didn't enter college, is that right? That is correct. That is correct. And that is going to become very important. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then the, the kind of cool part of the data are uh, the ability the, uh, to uh, link it to the Equifax credit reports. And at the time when we started the project, the thought was, 
this would be a great opportunity to look at kind of the long-term consequences of, say, this big reduction in student loan debt. And like, what effects does that have on credit scores and um, uh, all the things that you would naturally think of with credit data? You know, debt management stuff, delinquencies, defaults, um, mortgage debt, stuff like that. But as we started um, th looking at what was available there, we realized that some of these other outcomes you can infer from the credit data are in many ways like even more interesting. Like you can infer, did they own a house or not by looking at whether or not they ever held mortgage debt. And the ability to observe the zip code of residents, no matter where they moved in the country, allows you to look both at mobility, which was a, a big um, interest of the state. Uh, they're very you know, concerned about whether um, this uh, program made students more likely to leave the state. And um, also, um, to get this, we, we match the zip code data to information on um, zip code level earnings or zip code level income to get kind of a, a measure of the socioeconomic surroundings of, of where they're living. And that's kind of cool because, you know, um, not everybody who's age 28 is engaged full time in the labor, labor force. Um, and so this gets a way to get some sense of their socioeconomic conditions without a direct, um, necessarily looking directly at their own earnings. Okay, so to give a little intuition for the identification strategy before I go into detail, so this is a graph that's just plotting uh, actual receipts of the Promise Scholarship, so a proportion receiving the scholarship by ACT score. So this is going to be kind of the first stage in our fuzzy regression discontinuity. And you can see that there's this huge jump right where we're expecting it um, uh, at the ACT score cutoff. Now, why is it not 100% on this side of the threshold? Um, that's primarily due to this core course GPA that we don't observe. Um, so even if somebody has a th this, whole, um, this whole graph and our analysis is going to be limited to those who pass the GPA threshold, and then we're looking at did you pass the, the test score threshold. Um, but even those who pass the overall high school GPA of 3.0 and have, a, have a, a qualifying test score, some of them didn't meet this core course GPA, so they still didn't get the scholarship. And on this side of the threshold, um, because we have these ACT scores that are reported on the college application, um, our understanding is that it's basically you know, what you would report if you were applying to college, so kind of your best score at the time that you applied they could continue to take the test up through the summer just prior to enrollment and still qualify for the scholarship. So that could um, be the reason why some of those students still qualify. And then so we um, can do similar graphs looking at outcomes. And I have cherry picked here one where the graph looks kind of the clearest. Um, they don't all look like this. But what I will say is, and you can look in the paper, we do have graphs for all the outcomes that we look at. Um, the graphs generally line up with what you get out of the regression estimation. So where you see graphs like this, where it looks like there's a clear discontinuity um, here, um, that shows up in the regression um, coefficients as well. And the graphs where it looks messy and hard to see, in general, then you're not getting anything significant in the, um, in the regressions either. So this is um, the mean zip code income um, 10 to 11 years after they entered college. And so we can do the regression discontinuity for the eligible cohorts here in the blue, and then um, also do kind of a falsification test for the cohorts who entered earlier around the same threshold. We're not expecting to see anything going on there. So the RD estimates are based on this discontinuity here. In our difference and difference approach, um, what we're going to do is compare the average difference between uh, students who score above the threshold <coughs> before and after the scholarship was introduced, and compare that to those um, below the threshold before and after the scholarship was introduced. Um, the reason why we focus on the regression discontinuity, we think it, um, the identifying assumptions are more plausible. We can talk about that more later. Um, the advantage of the difference in difference, if you buy it, which we're not, uh, we, we think it's a little, they're a little more problematic, but the advantage of it, if you buy it, is it allows you to estimate uh, effects for a wider range of ACT scores. Okay, so I'm not going to talk through the equation because I want to make sure that we can actually get 
to um, some results and mechanisms. But um, we're using a fuzzy regress regression discontinuity strategy accounting for the fact that um, crossing the threshold doesn't 100% determine whether or not you receive the promise. It's about a 70 percentage point um, difference in receipt around the cutoff. I think I just pretty much talked about this. So what the fuzzy regression discontinuity is going to do is we can estimate a discontinuity in outcomes around the threshold. And essentially, it's going to scale that up um, by 1 over 0.71, which is the, the difference in take up around the threshold. Okay, we have a bunch of controls in here. Um, and we'll talk about why those are important in a, in a minute. Okay, so what I really want to get to is this question about, okay, but wait, you're looking at all of this for a sample of college enrollees. Right, everything that we're going to look at in this paper is conditional on showing up in our sample of West Virginia public college enrollees when part of the whole point of the scholarship was to induce more people to become West Virginia public college enrollees. And in fact, um, if you look at the, this is just a, a frequency distribution of enrollment before and after the scholarship was introduced, and the, these are actual counts of enrollees by ACT scores, you can see there are more enrollees and there appear to be differentially showing up in the eligible ranges here. So um, a few things to note. Okay, so why is this a problem? From a policy perspective, this is awesome. This is great. This is just what you want to see as a policymaker, basically. Um, it looks like you're, you're, you've implemented a program and it's having an effect. But in terms of estimating a causal impact for a sample conditional on enrollment, the worry is that enrollees are different. The enrollees are different after the scholarship is introduced. The enrollees also may be different right above the threshold versus right below the threshold. Um, and in particular, um, I think that the most, the biggest threat, a lot of people in RD studies are worried about test score manipulation or retesting. So what if students are just retaking the, the ACT until they get a score that's um, qualifying? If that's happening, we'll see some shifting from students below the threshold to above the threshold. Looks like some of that might be going on, but in percentage terms, it's actually like there are way more enrollees above the threshold then there are kind of missing ones below the threshold. So there might be a little bit of retaking going on, but most of this looks like it's new enrollment. And then the question is, where are those new enrollees coming from? Are they uh, students who were never going to enroll in college? Are they students who were going to enroll in college, but maybe like a couple years from now? Or, and this is the most problematic for our, our um, identification or, you know, for interpretation of the, our results, the most problematic possibility is what if these are just the super motivated, super high achieving students who prior to the scholarship were going to leave the state and go to Harvard or wherever, go to some out-of-state institution, and now the scholarship is inducing them to stay in state where they kind of bring up the averages for, for West Virginia but actually no additional human capital has been created. In fact, you know, maybe their outcomes could even be worse than they would have been had they left the state. So it's the out-of-state uh, hypothesis that, that some of this could be due to students just kind of shifting from out-of-state to in-state that's the most problematic for our uh, interpretation of results. Um, and what we do in the paper to try to deal with this um, directly is to do some bounding analyses, like what percent of students do, do we think could be coming from out of state? Um, luckily, we have other data sources that can speak to that. Um, and we can actually quantify, you know, in a typical year, how many students leave West Virginia and attend co uh, college out of state. And it, when we do that, we find out that, that still that number it can only account for like 30% of this new enrollment. There just aren't that many students in West Virginia that had been leaving the state prior to the scholarship for that to account for all of this. But it could account for some of it. Okay. So that's going to be uh, an issue that we deal with in the spend a lot of time dealing with in the paper. 
The one thing I will say for now, for the main results I'm going to show you, is that one of the key things that you worry about, you know, if you have this kind of um, changing population, is is this showing up in observable characteristics? So I think that's here. Okay, good. So we, we check, uh, using our regression discontinuity specification here, do we see significant differences in background characteristics for, for enrollees just above and just below the threshold? And we see a couple of things popping up here, notably high school GPA, and then whether or not uh, some, some uh, on other race. But in magnitude, this is pretty small. Um, and um, anything that's observable, we can control for. So the real worry is, is there some other unobservable thing um, that could be, you know, we're not picking up that's driving everything. Um, we don't see, you know, that this is, we find these results for the regression discontinuity to be fairly reassuring, and all of these things will be things that we control for in our analysis. For the difference in difference, it's a little more worrisome. First of all, we see bigger differences in the high school GPA, again, kind of in the direction that we would expect. And one of the ways that we interpret this is to the extent we have out-of-state students who are going to go out-of-state shifting to state and state, um, it is plausible that those students, uh, students who are going to go out of state might be the higher scoring, might be in the higher scoring ranges, so they might affect the RD less than they will affect the difference in difference. Set. Okay, so this is one reason why we kind of are not prioritizing the difference in difference results. They are in the paper, um, and they are broadly consistent with RD, um, but they... Uh, um, the identifying assumptions are potentially a little more challenging there. Okay, I'm going to start showing some regression tables. Okay, so, so what this is going to show, I'm going to show a bunch of numbers with the outcomes kind of going down the side here. Uh, this, these are just the mean outcome levels right around the threshold area where the RDE applies to. Uh, these are uh, the regression coefficients and standard errors. Um, and this is for our primary bandwidth, which is basically plus or minus uh, five ACT points. And then this is the same specification, but omitting all of the covariates. The idea there being that if the identification um, is really just coming from access to the scholarship around the threshold, we, we don't want to see that our results change a lot when we add covariates. As you can see here, the things shrink a little bit but kind of the broad pattern um, very much holds up and is not super sensitive to the inclusion of those control variables. So we see big effects here on the likelihood of earning a bachelor's degree within four years. This, is, this top line is basically a replication, just confirming that actually, the, you know, still true what I'd found in this prior study. But now we can follow them up much longer, um, and if you trace this out over time, you can see that every year longer that you follow them up, that BA effect kind of gets smaller and smaller. I was actually quite, as much as I study higher ed statistics, I was quite um, impressed or surprised at how long that people are still plugging at it. You still see people completing those bachelor's degrees. Of course, you know, five or six years you get most of it, but every year beyond that, it's like another percent, another percent, another percent adding up. So by the end of 10 years, there's only this kind of very shadow of a treatment effect there, two percentage points, no longer statistically significant. At the same time, as that effect is fading out, you see other effects fading in. So the likelihood of getting a graduate degree, um, a 40% increase, so from 11 percentage points, uh, goes up to 15 percentage points for those who had access to the scholarship. Okay, then we have a bunch of um, earnings-related effects here. Um, no difference in the likelihood of being employed year-round in West Virginia. That's where we have our earnings data from. And then we do a couple of conditional earnings measures. So conditional on being employed year-round in West Virginia, average earnings. Conditional on living in West Virginia, whether you're working or not, an earnings estimate there. And so these are in a positive direction, but they're super noisy, a little bit more sensitive to controls. 
Now, if we proceed to the um, outcomes based on the Equifax data, one thing that you want to check is, do you see any differences in the likelihood of matching to the Equifax data in the first place? That could potentially uh, be problematic. We don't see any difference there, and the match rate is quite high, 92%. It's not 100%. Not, not everybody has a credit record. There are reasons why um, sometimes people don't match, even if they do have a record, but we don't see any difference in match rates around the threshold. We don't see any uh, impact on the likelihood of living in the state. Again, this is, um, this is an ever, did you ever live outside West Virginia? Uh, for students, right around the ACT score cutoff, that's about 23%, and no difference for those above and below the, the threshold. Then this is our zip code income measure, and here we do see a, a significant and substantively uh, meaningful sized effect there. One thing that's kind of interesting, could just be coincidence, but the scale here is kind of in the same range as the, the individual earnings measure. So it doesn't seem crazy. Then we see this, a six percentage point impact on ever owning a home um, off of a base of about 36% for this group. And um, here is where we see some interesting patterns going on with student loans. These um, we probe more in some appendix tables. Basically, what is going on with student loans? The program has a significant, um, significantly reduces undergraduate debt and significantly reduces the likelihood that, um, that someone ever has a student loan. But on average, the student loan balance at the end of this period is actually higher for students who qualify for the scholarship. If you break that out, why is that? It's graduate debt. So um, there's kind of this, this trade-off where um, we weren't necessarily uh, looking for this, but as it turns out, students who qualify for Promise end up with more student loan debt um, 10 years after entry because they basically more than replace um, their undergraduate loans with graduate loans, yes? So, Judy, I've been thinking about mm -hmm. that. So, <coughs> so, here, like the natural experiment you're measuring is we're going to take these college students, and some of them we're going to say, we're only going to give you aid if you finish 30 credits per year and, and have to keep a GPA of, of 3.0, and others, we don't care how long it takes you. Now, so aside from the stacking problem, mm -hmm. you know, at, at 21, it seems like a pretty clean test of that, mm -hmm. you know, proposition. So even if you don't have the college students, you still have a fairly clean test of the, is the, can we, but the stacking is, is a concern. So are there any subsets of students um, for whom the stacking isn't an issue? Mm -hmm. Like, like, so I was just thinking, who would have been the kids that would have been very unlikely to have been going out of state anyway? Mm -hmm. Like, so low-income kids, um, you know, kids who, whose parents went to West Virginia. Yeah, like, I mean... So, mm -hmm. so, like, is there any way, like, could you identify any subsets of kids <coughs> for whom you don't see this? So, um, I, I, I definitely think that's <clears throat> a good intuition, but the issue is that there are these multiple sources that are driving that extra kind of extra density. Yeah, yeah. And the, so if you could, you could kind of limit it to samples that wouldn't be affected by that, but you won't get rid of that extra density because a lot of it is coming from the kids who went to public school, the kids who... Because um, now they're enrolling in college. Right, just right. And I think part of it, um, this isn't really in the paper, but, you know, kind but of on the reflection... Bias goes the mm -hmm. other way. Right, like, yeah. exactly. The bias could go the other way for those students. And, yeah. and I think, um, you know, we can get into this in the kind of discussions. After spending a lot of time with these data and with the um, this... Um, with this um, scholarship program and, and thinking about the context in West Virginia, I mean, um, so one thing of this, one feature of the scholarship was you had to um, be within a couple of years of high school graduation in order to get it. So one of the things that it could have done was some of that new enrollment could be pushing students up as well. So it's it's not 
I think it's it's reassur it's it's given me some reason um, to to be uh, to think that those new enrollees that are showing up here or the additional enrollments they really may not be radically different from the students who um, were going to be there anyway. Some of that is you know the students enrolling right away instead of waiting two years, and I think that. Um, the observable, observable characteristics kind of reflect that. Like, you might see a little bit, but it's like they, there's no evidence that they look radically different um, from the students who are already there. Um, but we do, you know, if we have time, I can talk a little bit about the bounding that we try to test the sensitivity to different assumptions. That's a question. Very quick. Um, can yeah. you talk, since it's one of the significant yeah. ones, ever owned a home, and I'm, I'm wondering... Um, about the choice of ever owned a home as opposed to owned a home at the end. I, I think that at least part of this sample, maybe maybe it's not so important because it's probably earlier in the sample, but at least part of this time period was the financial crisis where owning a home was not necessarily right. a good thing. Yeah. Um, so let me just think about it. So if we were going to do, did you own a home at the end? I mean, the, the measure is literally like, do you have mortgage debt? So I guess if they, you know, got out of it, then they would no longer, if they didn't have any mortgage debt at the end, but then they, so maybe they could have paid it off. I'd have to think, but I mean, in theory, that should be something we could infer from the data. So you're just looking to see, the, the measure is, do you have mortgage debt when we look at you at the very end? Uh, no, this one is, did you ever have did mortgage debt? you ever yeah. have mortgage debt? But I'm saying, I think we could, you know, we could create an alternative well, I suspect <laughs> most of this, I don't know exactly when all the default, when all the mortgage defaults took place, but I, I, I couldn't figure it out in my head, but it seems to me like yeah. many of these people are probably buying houses, if they're buying houses, given the time there, it's probably after 2008. Uh, yes, yeah, that's definitely, uh, definitely true. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely something that we thought about, like, uh, that it's not obvious that this is necessarily, you know, a good app, which is one of the reasons why we have these other things about, you know, negative, negative um, credit outcomes. Um, all that stuff is going in uh, the right direction. Um, West Virginia was not necessarily, like, the hotbed of the, the real estate um, boom. Um, but, you know, even within states like West Virginia, there are always, like, can be localized um, things going on. So that's uh, point taken. Yes? This is uh, potentially just a nit, but in West Virginia, how many kids are in, what proportion of college students are in that bandwidth? It seems pretty wide. Um, so, so I should have said, um, if we go back to, uh, like, a graph here. So... We're not literally, it's not like, uh, we're using a local linear regression discontinuity specification, which means whatever the bandwidth is, and we test sensitivity to different bandwidths, uh, but whatever the bandwidth is, all of our estimates are always trying to figure out what's the discontinuity right at this threshold. So even when we include students further away from the threshold, we're only including them to help us figure out the slope of this line, which then is helping us to estimate this discontinuity. So we're not making the assumption that these students here are like equivalent to these students up here. Except to the extent that they shape the regression. Except to the extent that they change the, the shape of the, the regression line, which is why we do test sensitivity to different um, bandwidths, including uh, using some optimal bandwidth, um, you know, calculators to guide that. We ended up, you know, it, it doesn't, uh, for the outcomes that are sensitive, uh, you know, that are not significant, you know, this, you can kind of tell, um, let me see if I have any, like for the ones that we're focusing on here, um, the, the home ownership, the graduate degree completion, the mean zip code income, those are very stable across the different bandwidths, you know, for the ones that are fragile, um, like for example, um, the earnings here, those are fragile throughout. And the same with, uh, like, some of these credit ones are very small in magnitude. They're going in the right direction, but they're, they're not statistically significant. And so, depending on the bandwidth, maybe they pop in some and not others. We don't, we try not to over-interpret them. Yeah? Are you able to confirm your student loan story about undergrad loans? Um, looking at 
student loan debt after five years or something like that? Well, we actually know. Um, so for the student loan data, we have um, we have multiple sources. So for this here, we're taking this from Equifax because that's like the broadest measure and it's telling you like how much they actually um, owe at the end. But from the West Virginia data, we know the loans that are being made on their way out. So we, we can identify undergraduate loans um, provided versus graduate loans provided. And so we can confirm that um, we see reductions in undergraduate and then um, increases in graduate debt. Okay, so we also, so this is, these are the, uh, this column is the results you just saw. We can do the same regression discontinuity for the cohorts prior to the entry, prior to the implementation of Promise. And what we're looking for there is hopefully mostly zeros. Um, we do see uh, one statistically significant effect here that we would not expect. Um, but again, that these uh, were pretty noisy to begin with, so kind of don't want to like totally oversell the earnings impacts just to say, you know, they seem like they're in a positive direction, but um, for the rest of the story, most of these coefficients uh, not only are not statistically significant, but are getting much smaller, closer to zero. So that's kind of um, reassuring. Okay, so we do a bunch of robustness checks in the paper, um, which I'm not going to show here because I have 10 minutes, um, but you know, alternate bandwidths, not, not a big issue. Um, different ways of calculating standard errors, not a big issue. Um, a multiple hypothesis testing, depending on kind of how strict you want to be um, about it. Um, our, our outcomes uh, here are robust if you control for a false discovery rate of 0.2. Um, okay, one, one uh, alternative analysis that relies on a totally separate source of variation is to use the renewal requirement um, that students had, had to have a first year GPA of 2.75. So then we don't have the same kind of sample selection worries. Um, and if we do that, um, basically you see lots of stars and huge effects on everything um, to the point that I was like, whoa, I don't know if we want to um, of course, some of the reviewers of the paper were like, this is great, you should totally, um, so I don't, the reason why I didn't want to totally um, put too much on the first year GPA thing is because there's still issues there. It's, it's still possible to, to manage your first year GPA, especially with summer enrollments, you know, you've got that like extra third semester, you can, you can uh, get your GPA up if you need to. Um, but it is reassuring that this totally separate source of identification shows results all going in the same direction. Yes? I was just wondering if you tried a version where you did it jointly. Where did what? Where oh. you did it jointly with the GPA and the... For the, um, so for the initial eligibility requirements? Yeah. Great. So I was expecting that question to come up sooner. So, yeah. So there are two requirements to initially qualify for the scholarship. The ACT or SAT requirement and the GPA requirement. Um, as it turns out, the ACT requirement is much more binding. So um, conditional on being above a 3.0 GPA, there are still a lot of people that don't meet the test score cutoff. Conditional on meeting the test score cutoff, there aren't that many people who aren't already above a 3.0 GPA. So if I was to do that kind of first stage graph, um, you know, looking above and below the high school GPA cutoff, which I actually should just have here, but I don't, um, the, the difference in promise receipt around the high school GPA threshold is only about 13 to 20 percentage points, depending on how you specify the first stage. Now, people have said, well, you should do it anyway. So we're going to do it anyway. Um, but, but if yeah. you combine, I mean, you can, there are ways to Yeah, do it so there are ways to combine it. And um, my, my philosophy, I mean, you know, there's no right or wrong way. What I would say my philosophy on that is, is it adds a lot of complexity. Um, and kind of changes, it makes it harder to figure out who's the marginal group that you're talking about. So we kind of went with the simple, the simplicity here. Um, but, you know, that is something actually reviewers have asked us to, to do more on that. So we, we will. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I remember you had two cohorts looked at in terms of the program. Did the results look different 
for the two, even sort of like the stacking around the scores out of curiosity? You might imagine with the second um, year of the program that you know, stacking. I don't have papers, or sorry, I don't have any um, graphs here that break it out by cohort. In the prior paper, where I was focused much more on like the in-college outcomes, I did look at it by <coughs> cohort, and you do see things showing up right away in the first cohort. It didn't look like there was an obvious um, distinction between the first two, but we haven't done that um, for these longer-term follow-up outcomes. Did the stacking look the same in terms of around, like, the ACT scores? Um, my recollection work? was yes, okay. but I would have to go back and double-check. Yes. So I'm curious for the earnings outcomes that you, sh that you showed. Do you think those are essentially downward bias because there's a bunch of students still in grad school who aren't really earning what ultimately they will be? Or one of the things you mentioned previously is maybe this is changing the types of majors that students yeah. are going into, what they're studying, and did you find any sort of evidence of that? So I didn't, we didn't see, uh, let me get to the mechanisms um, to <laughs> speak to some of those questions, but just as far as like how to interpret the earnings, I do think it is still a little early to be looking at earnings. In some ways, that's why kind, I, I kind of like this zip code measure of earnings um, as being a, maybe a little bit broader measure, or maybe a little bit more durable or meaningful measure of the socioeconomic. Sorry? It might incorporate expected gains. Right, it might incorporate kind of, yeah, expected gains over the long term as opposed to the kind of what you happen to be doing right now at this point in your life. Um, the employed year-round is trying to, you know, rule out, um, uh, and I think I have to go back and, yeah, I think that's just, you know, did you have earnings in all four quarters? I can't remember if we put any minimum earnings on there that would make it kind of more comparable to full-time. But we're trying to screen out, you know, people who are not in the labor market at all, at least. Yes. Um, did you have zip code data for students when they were actually applying at the very beginning? Um, what we have is high, high school county. Okay, so that's a little coarser then. But yeah. I was say, it could be really interesting. Yeah, and we do include high school here. county fixed effects as we don't have family income. So we don't have, we can't control for, so that, you know, in our covariates, that's one of the ones that we would like to be able to control for. Um, but we do have high school county fixed effects as a way to try to, you know, soak up if it's, you know, that the more advantaged counties are more represented in the scholarship group. Can, can you do that for facts on the parents? I would love to be able to do that, but no. Um, yeah, we tried to think about that. I think that would be really interesting, too, because um, we see effects on parent loans also, reductions in parent loans. So let me get to, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip over all this great, awesome stuff we do on selection bias. Um, I'll, I'll summarize it by saying that... Um, there's no way to make it as clean as you would like it to be. Um, on balance, um, there's more evidence that the effects that you see are due to uh, effects of the program rather than to selection. But if your prior is very strong, that it's all about selection, you know, we can't, we can't rule that out beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't think beyond a reasonable doubt is the right standard um, for policy evaluation. Um, but... Read, um, I'm happy to talk with you guys later or look in the paper if you want to go into more detail on that. I just want to show a couple things on mechanisms before we end. Um, so there are a number of mechanisms that could lead to uh, these uh, differences in home ownership, differences in zip code earnings, differences in graduate enrollment. Could be actually that the renewal requirements lead to improved effort, increased effort during college, higher human capital accumulation. Um, it could be uh, purely getting students through faster, giving them kind of a head start on whatever's coming next. Or it could have something to do with reductions in student debt. So um, what we do to kind of explore this, and this is not experimental, this is not definitive, but just suggestive, is we control for some of these interme intermediate outcomes and see to what extent do all of our effects disappear if we control for that intermediate outcome. If the effects go away, that's kind of more suggestive that maybe that's an important channel. If they are unaffected, it suggests that maybe that's not such an important channel. So we do it for a few different things. I'll just show you a couple here. So one is controlling for um, cumulative undergraduate borrowing. And that does um, like 
comparing these first and third columns doesn't do that much to the pattern of, of effects except for the student loan outcomes kind of, um, um, uh, kind of mechanically. So that doesn't seem like it's a huge channel. If we look at on-time BA completion, on the other hand, controlling for that significantly reduces the magnitude and significance of the results. Um, still, still some stuff showing up there, so it's not like that's necessarily everything, but that does seem to matter a lot. Um, even controlling for cumulative uh, GPA at the end of four years um, cuts things by quite a bit, but not completely. Okay, so I'm really getting to my last slide here. Um, so to summarize, students who just barely qualify for the Promise Scholarship are more likely to graduate on time, more likely to earn graduate degrees, more likely to own a home, and they live in higher income zip codes. Um, they're no more likely to live or work out of state. And as far as the, um, the earnings and credit in impacts are kind of noisy, um, but seem to be going in the right direction. If we look at the difference in difference results, we see a generally consistent, I didn't show those here, they're in the paper, generally a consistent pattern, a little more muted, possibly suggesting that um, impacts are smaller for students higher up the, the ACT score distribution. And the reduction in time to degree appears to be a more pl plausible mechanism than reductions in undergraduate debt. So as far as the kind of cost benefit analysis for this program, we do something very back of the envelope in the paper, um, suggesting it would easily pass a, a cost benefit test in this case, but as, uh, as many of you have pointed out, um, the, the details of this program are different than merit aid programs in other states, different than need-based programs um, at the state and federal level, and so it's not totally clear how generalizable the results here would be to other forms of financial aid. And that's all I have. Um, so I'm like two minutes over, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. We can take a minute or two for questions. Okay. People have questions, additional questions. <laughs> Do you see anything about um, marital status in the oh, data? Oh, yeah. So actually that marriage. came up. Um, so when we initially matched, we included last name as one of our match characteristics. And um, we got much better match rates for the men than for the women. And we realized, oh, probably we shouldn't do that. And then, um, then we thought, oh, maybe we construct a marital status thing. Um, you can try to infer something. Uh, we didn't see anything going on on that. And you know, uh, people weren't totally sure how to interpret that measure. But in theory, it was kind of inferred. It wasn't direct. But I mean, even if you don't see a difference in the rate at which people marry, you'd think there might be a difference in who they're marrying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Knowledge. Unfortunately, that we can't observe. Again, unless it's showing up in the zip code income. Yeah. I have two related, hopefully, quick questions. Yes. Kind of going back to the way you started the talk with the, the goal of this program yeah. being to raise the educational attainment rate of, the, of West Virginia. So one is this idea of, of students being no more likely to live or work in state. How much of that might be that students are going out of state for grad school? And then also this idea of cost benefit. Is the cost benefit thinking about at the individual level, like the, the private returns to education? Or have you looked at all in terms of kind of state tax rules? And so I'll do the second one first, which is just super back of the envelope based on the, the individual returns. We didn't try to do anything fancy with um, social returns. Um, with the first one, um, I'm not totally sure. So the, 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 where they're living, um, we can see that if they go out of state. So um, I'm not totally sure how that connects to the graduate school. So if they go out of state for graduate school, we won't see them as being enrolled in graduate school in our data because we only have the in-state academic data. But we would see them as having ever lived out of state. Right. I guess I'm sort of thinking about... Um with the yeah. students going out of state for graduate school and then coming back to the state to serve because they have sort of more connections to their community. So that could that could be happening here and it wouldn't show up in anything other than I mean that that, that could be something that just is going on and we we don't really have a great if way. They ever lived out of state. Well, if they ever yes. Um yeah, the, with the, the yeah. Did they come back? Right. So the ever lived out of state is ever. So if they go out and they come back, we would see that. So there doesn't look like there's any increase in that. But we could, I mean, we could be missing some graduate school enrollment. 
Is there any way to infer out-of-state graduate school enrollment from the Equifax loans? Like a loan that happens after achieving a BA, for example? A student loan that happens after achieving yeah, a BA? Yeah, we probably could. Yeah, we probably could. Would that effort lift out of state help you resolve some of this question that we were talking about earlier with the people returning? So if, if effort lift out of state includes while I was a student, you know, if you saw, you know, any difference in these two cohorts in, you know, in the pre versus the post cohorts in the ever out of state at the threshold? I'll have to think about that. I mean, I definitely think that if, you're, if your prior, if your worry is that this is all being driven by students who are going to go out of state now um, just deciding to do their undergrad in state, I think you're right that we would have expected to see um, that the scholarship recipients are more likely to leave the state. Because, like, if those are the, mar if the marginal student is this, like, cross-state mobile... Um, I, I, well, I, I was yeah. just thinking pre versus post, like, before... The experiment, you know. But I guess the problem is we can't observe the ones we only have matched the ones who ever enrolled in West Virginia. You know, so we don't right. the ones who go out of state <laughs> in the very first place we never see. But thank you very much. Thank you. Afterwards, right um, around, the, right back here, right back behind this wall. <laughs> <laughs> so feel free to bring the food in here or go downstairs.